someone like yourself, you've got a history of grabbing that opportunity. Um, what, what's specifically interesting to me about this, though, is that uh, you mentioned you are already outgrown two or three gyms. You've got a so so you run a Tenth Planet Jiu Jitsu gym, very popular brand, obviously. Eddie Bravo created it. Um, how did you first get involved with with Tenth Planet? Like, what what made you decide this was the system that you wanted to pursue? You know, I uh, I moved to LA in two thousand five. Um, I, I was doing, you know, dabbling a little bit in, uh, in martial arts here in Colorado, but, but not really. I got a desk job out there selling dental equipment from a cubicle in Culver city <laughs> and, uh, and was ready to tear my eyes out. And, uh, so I was talking to a college roommate of mine, a kid named Ryan Ciatoli, who runs a, a gym up in, uh, Ithaca and, you know, mentioned to him that I'm going nuts. You know, I need, I need something. And, uh, so that, yeah, there's a guy out there named Eddie Bravo, and, and he does uh, he does jujitsu, but you don't have to wear that silly uniform, and it's a whole lot uh, more like wrestling. You should go check it out. And it was only a couple blocks from my house, and wow. uh, so I just gave Eddie a call, and uh, you know he found out that I wrestled for five years in college, and and was stoked to have me. Wow. So uh, just you know jumped right in, fell in love, and uh, you know kind of kind of took it from there. This is the prize fighting business. I'm your host, Daniel Casado, and today my guest is the owner of 10th Planet Jiu Jitsu Denver, as well as a veteran fighter of the Strike Force and IFL promotions, Connor Hewn. Connor went 9 and 5 overall as a professional prize fighter, and he now coaches his own competition and fight team over at 10th Planet. The gym has also recently changed locations to accommodate the business's growth. Connor sat down with me to discuss the new changes, how his team has navigated this COVID situation, and his martial arts journey up to this point, including what the future holds. So let's dive back into my conversation with Connor Hewn. Connor, thank you very much for joining me. Yeah, man. Happy to be here. And a pleasure to have you because you've had a, a full martial artist, at least the front end of a career. You, you fought professionally um, for major promotions like Strike Force and uh, kind of a little bit even before things exploded on the MMA scene as far as the UFC becoming the preeminent organization. Um, but where you were still having to navigate kind of this this journey of a martial artist on your own. You know, I don't think there was any clear blueprint necessarily for someone like you to follow. Um, and so I definitely want to dive into kind of how you got involved originally. But uh, first, tell me a little bit more about what's going on right now. You know, we're in the middle of coronavirus and you just so happen to be opening a gym as this happens. So uh, kind of tell me where you are with that and what's going on. Yeah, I mean, uh, we've been open since uh, November 1st, 2018. But uh, we continue to outgrow our spaces, and uh, we yeah basically outgrew our third space. Wow! And, uh, and we're actively searching for a new building uh, when the lockdown happened, and so we were sort of you know juggling some things there. Um, so you didn't have it found yet when when everything locked down and went no, into place. Wow! No, no not at all. Um, yeah, no, we were we were just scrambling, and we had. Uh, we were in negotiations with one spot and they were offering us uh, 1350 per square foot. They were going to do all the renovations or 1150 per square foot. And we had to do the renovations. Okay. But they had like two different brokers. And so we kept getting sort of like different messages going back and forth. And we agreed to do the 1150, but we'll do everything. Right. Because we've got some guys on the team that do, you know, drywall and construction and electricity nice. and all that stuff. Um, but when we went back to them to accept that offer, they said that that was no longer an offer, huh. uh, that it was just going to be uh, 1350 and them doing the work. Interesting. And so uh, we started looking for other places. We got about two weeks deep into the process at another location. Um, and then they found out that it was going to trigger a, uh, we needed to change a use permit. And that was going to trigger a landscaping requirement by the city. <laughs> which whatever, Red tape. Yeah, whatever that means right but so uh so they then said that they didn't want to do the deal All right. luckily since we'd we'd basically ghosted the first business after you know getting mixed messages from them we went back to them and they uh and we finally signed at 11 dollars a square foot with them doing all the work so, oh nice so you yeah. ended up in a better position anyway yeah basically, i'll take it yeah we're gonna 
you know, probably save us about a hundred thousand bucks. Wow. The lease. That's phenomenal. I mean, so, you know, downside of this situation is obviously you can't have the full practices, but it did work out a little bit to your advantage as far as the negotiation end of things. Yeah. I mean, I, I tell people, you know, it's, it's like jujitsu when one door closes, you just got to find the other door. Absolutely. You know, something's always open. Yeah. Opportunity. Yeah. And, and someone like yourself, you've got a history of grabbing that opportunity. Um, what, what's specifically interesting to me about this though, is that, uh, you mentioned you are already outgrown two or three gyms. You've got, uh, so, so you run a 10th planet jujitsu gym, very popular brand, obviously Eddie Bravo created it. Um, how did you first get involved with, with 10th planet? Like what, what made you decide this was the system that you wanted to pursue? You know, I, uh, I moved to LA in 2005. Um, I, I was doing, you know, dabbling a little bit in, uh, in martial arts here in Colorado, but, but not really. I got a desk job out there selling dental equipment from a cubicle in Culver City <laughs> and uh, and was ready to tear my eyes out. And uh, so I was talking to a college roommate of mine, a kid named Ryan Ciotoli, who runs a, a gym up in uh, Ithaca, and, you know, mentioned to him that I'm going nuts. You know, I need I need something. And uh, he's like, yeah, there's a guy out there named Eddie Bravo, and, and he does, uh, does jujitsu, but you don't have to wear that silly uniform. And it's a whole lot uh, more like wrestling. You should go check it out. And it was only a couple blocks from my house. And wow. uh, so I just gave Eddie a call. And, uh, you know, he found out that I wrestled for five years in college and, and was stoked to have me. Wow. So uh, just, you know, jumped right in, fell in love and uh, you know, kind of kind of took it from there. Yeah. And I mean, you've made a career out of it and you're continuing to make a career out of it even after uh, fighting as a professional. And I think that's something that a lot of fighters know in the back of their mind. That's something that they've got to figure out, you know, what comes after fighting. Um, but obviously they also have to focus a hundred percent on the task at hand, which is being a professional fighter. And if they want to be the best in the world, it, it does take full focus and full belief. Um, so it, it's interesting how you kind of created this on the back of your career. Is it something that you were thinking the whole time while you're fighting? Yeah. I mean, I knew I wanted to be a coach my whole life. Cool. Uh, my dad was a coach. Um, coached high school at, uh, at Fairview and Boulder for probably 15 years. Uh, he was at, you know, junior highs and, and stuff uh, before that. So I always knew that that, that was sort of um, the plan, but I didn't understand how it would be financially feasible. You know, so my dad was a teacher, and so he was in the school, and he figured it out one time that, like, hourly he was making something like 13 cents an hour um, for the coaching. Yeah. You know, just because you're you're going to summer camps, you're going to freestyle tournaments, you're doing all this stuff to build the program in the off season where you're not making anything. It's a pursuit of passion, <laughs> like fighting. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just really blessed that, that I happened to get in with Eddie. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because, you know, he's blown up. You know, back then I was I was training with Joe before he had his podcast. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'd say probably 90% of the people who walk in the door when we ask them how they heard about us, they say through Joe Rogan. Wow. We talk about marketing. I mean, literally yeah. the biggest, if not the number one, number two or three biggest podcast in the world right now. Over 4 million subscribers just signed a $100 million uh, deal with Spotify. So, like you said, I mean, that's the best marketing you can get, essentially. Yeah. People pay top dollar for that for that sure. marketing. Yeah, I got real lucky. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, how does that translate? I mean, do you feel that you still need to spend on a marketing budget, or do you feel like that's generally enough? We've spent we've spent $0 on wow. marketing. Wow, that's amazing. Um, that's amazing. You know, I, I think uh, caring is yeah. important. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, I care deeply about making the most technically sound grapplers on the planet. And, and that's what we're about. And so when somebody comes in and, and I care about the individual, you know, yeah. I, it's uh, life's hard and, uh, and jujitsu's hard. And uh, I think when you come in there and you, you put yourself on the line and you test yourself, you put yourself in adversity, push yourself into the flame that you come out stronger. And so when we, when we test ourselves every day in the gym, it prepares us to be tested outside in the real world where it really matters. Absolutely. I love that. <laughs> and you know, something else that's super interesting about this is that you mentioned even without your marketing budget that you've outgrown your space uh, three times now. So wh what is that? I mean, is it just that you, you start to be in an area, people start to find out? I mean, obviously the business practice itself, your, your focus on the individual is a big, big part of it. But, you know, how do you feel like you grow a gym um, effectively? You know, I think I think you got to take care of the members that you have. Um, you know, I, if if somebody misses practice for a week, they're getting a text from me or a phone call from me Very nice. to see where they're at. Um, and then winning, winning helps. Yeah. You know, we uh, we won Naga 
uh, our first year. Um, you know, less than a year being open, we won, uh, you know, the Nogi uh, portion of Naga. We've won the last uh, two Colorado Jiu-Jitsu Club tournaments that we've entered. Um, you know, kind of proof is in the pudding. Absolutely. And, uh, and I think that people understand that training in the gi is, is outdated. Sure. And, and, you know, I mean, it's it's a fun game if, if you're in it to play games, but if you're in it to win championships, you train the way you fight and you fight without a gi on. Yep. And, you know, self-defense-wise, nobody's wearing, you know, nobody's wearing a gi. Right. Um, very true. And, you know, I mean, even just for laundry purposes, right? You can, I, <laughs> I, I, I can wash a whole week's <laughs> worth of training clothes in one load of laundry. If you're training in the gi, it's like you train twice a day, right? So that's two gis. That's a full load of laundry. Yeah, so yeah. I think you, you start to write your laundry expenses. That's off right. Of the, off of the membership. Save some money. Make sense. <laughs> cool. And you mentioned before the show uh, off camera that, you know, something that you've actually recently done is stopped your personal training, which a lot of people right now are increasing their personal training because of the, the difficulties around coronavirus. But you said, you know, for me to truly deliver what the value and the level of focus that I want to my existing um, you know, client students, then I don't want to have to work six, eight hours a day personal training and show up tired. So yeah, tell me a little bit more about that, because that's not something you hear that often. Yeah, man, I just, um, I was sort of sort of blown away with the response of how many people were willing to keep paying their dues even when we weren't able to train. That is amazing. And, and it speaks, it's a <clears throat> testament to you, right? It's a testament to you running the business and treating people well. Yeah, I hope so. You know, I hope so. Um, you know, we, we pivoted pretty quickly and, and started running. We've got like 18 classes online a week. Wow. Um, five of those are meditation. Um, two of them are yoga. We've got two myofascial release classes. We've got mm. kickboxing. We've got uh, strength training. Um, we've got jujitsu. But jujitsu is the hardest one to translate, you know, uh, when people don't have a partner. And, you know, it's I feel like that's sort of the the uh, most challenging class sort of on the current schedule. Absolutely. But yeah, I just realized like if these, if these people are willing to believe in me, I've got to believe in myself enough to go all in. Yeah. So I love it. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Well, I mean, it's, that's what's so uh, refreshing or so attractive about martial arts in general. I feel like that it is a, a lifestyle. It's a, an immersion. People don't you know, put one foot into martial arts for the most part. You know, you have people that go to cardio kickboxing classes or show up to jujitsu twice a week, but you, you see it. You see the change in people. You see people's uh, attitudes uh, about what they're doing change. And maybe sometimes they haven't taken anything else in life outside of their career that seriously before. And then they find something that they can they pour their passion into, which which you've done. I mean, like I said, you not only had a career, but now you're making a second career out of it yeah. through through this gym. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh... It's, it's pretty powerful just seeing what it can do for people's lives. Like we've got so many guys on the team that are in recovery, yep. you know, that are, uh, that are sober, that are, you know, trying to get a second shot at life yep. and, uh, and, you know, just seeing the impact that, that building a quality community where they have people that count on them. They know yep. that if they're not there, uh, you know, for, for the open mat, that somebody's going to be calling them to ask where they are. And a lot of these guys have never had somebody do that before. Yep. You know, they've never had, somebody care about them that much yeah, yeah it's and true so you know that that makes a huge difference when you're when you're thinking about just yourself it's easy to fall back into old habits right but when you know that you got a team behind you that's counting on you to be there and training partners that are counting on you i think it gives you that little extra layer of accountability absolutely a community or, or a family you know for uh if you want to take it one step further there and I, I agree that does create not only that accountability but that structure for people i could tell you right now like sometimes i do feel a little lost without knowing that i have more tie at the end of the day or, sure. or something to look forward to you know you got to figure out your your own new structure and create your own structure and yes you can expect uh everybody to create structure in their lives but the, the bottom line is it's challenging and that's a lot of times where the value of a community a team a family a gym comes in and providing that that structure that's not created by one person necessarily. Obviously, you that's your idea and your brainchild, but it, it's come together through the efforts of all these people. You know, the, the community isn't one person. It, it's everybody involved. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, we've got a pretty strict no assholes policy. I like that. <laughs> it works out pretty good for Don't us. be a dick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so tell me a little bit more about your co the coaching side of things. So how does that work? You know, primarily you guys are a jiu-jitsu gym. Do you also train mixed martial arts fighters or is it uh, jiu-jitsu competition specifically? You know, we have been uh, a jiu-jitsu gym only um, at our new space. Uh, we're on our own for the first time. We were... Uh, 
we were sharing in that space with Genesis, mm-hmm. um, and that's uh, that's primarily a, a striking gym. If you look at their fighters, right. every time they lose, it's because they got submitted. They're great on their feet, but uh, they need some grappling work. So we thought that would be a great fit to come in over there. So we didn't, you know, we were working with their fighters uh, for a period of time, you know, primarily just on the grappling and, mm-hmm. and on blending the two. But yeah, now that we're in our new space, we're offering striking classes. We're oh, going, neat! Yeah, we're we're you know we're we're coming. Cool, <laughs> cool. I like it. Very neat. So, uh, so total mixed martial arts approach, but obviously you guys are jujitsu specialists. Same That's man. your bread and butter. Um, how, how do you approach that? Like, is there a number of tournaments that you guys want to do each year? Is it... we we can yeah we're a competition team. Cool. Uh, we compete every every month for sure. Nice. Um, before when we first opened, we were doing every tournament. But then I was realizing, like, I need a day off. Yep. Um, now now that I'm not personal training anymore, you know, maybe we'll start doing some more uh, more tournaments. But we basically figured, okay, let's focus on one tournament a month. But, yeah, we compete um, as frequently as possible with the uh, broadest rule set that we can find. So mm-hmm. we're looking for submission-only tournaments, submission-friendly tournaments, meaning that, mm-hmm. you know, heel hooks, uh, you know, that's the, the big thing. And um, especially harder to find kind of blue belt and below too i mean in the prevailing yeah i mean uh, when we first started i would talk about what was legal and what wasn't legal um i've completely abandoned that um it's like you know we're we're here to to learn how to uh break other people's bodies and and we're going to teach you every way that we know how yeah not Um, so restrictive that way yeah and, and it's like the week before a tournament, it's like yeah. we'll focus on some straight ankle sure. locks as opposed to, you know, passing the leg to the other side yeah, yeah. And, and blowing up the knee. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, as far as like sort of the, the blend, um, Heather Joe Clark is uh, is our head MMA coach. Um, Veteran MMA fighter as well? Yeah. I mean, you know, she was at one point, you know, top 10 in the world at a yeah. weight class. Yeah. Um, and uh, and she sort of heads the, uh, the MMA program. Cool. Um, She's got a, a much more diverse striking background than I do. Sure. Um, if you watch my fights, you know, no no head movement. Uh, sure. Pretty pretty basic stuff. I never switched stances when I was fighting. Um, all of this more advanced techniques that I've learned, I've learned since retirement. And mm. I've learned most of them from her. Cool. Um, she's got, you know, really uh, just a wealth of knowledge. She worked with uh, Benny the Jet. Yeah. Um, she worked with Mike Winklejohn. Cool. Um, you know, her uh, list of coaches that she's trained under is, is absolutely the best in the world. Robert Follis uh, yep. at uh, Extreme Couture. The Great League, Robert Follis, yeah. Yeah, so um, she really, you know, she puts all of that stuff together. Um, my style, my belief in, in the, the way that fights should happen, right? I was, I was fighting because I needed to protect myself. I was 112 pounds my senior year in high school. Wow. And uh, had a big mouth. <laughs> um, for me, you got to close the distance, right? When yep. when we're at uh, at a striking range, anybody can knock anybody out. Um, the faster and more effectively that I close the distance and get to a dominant position, the safer I am. Yep. So for me, it's it's how do I close that distance as quickly and safely as possible, secure a takedown into a dominant position, and finish with a choke. Nice. There's you know, joint locks work, but uh, f- to me, the choke is the king. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. You hear, it doesn't matter how tough you are when there's no blood to your brain. Right. You hear, uh, you know, I guess you, one of your main competitors down on her death squad, you hear them kind of uh, reiterate that too, that they, they like the chokes a lot, get into the back. I mean, you can do, you know, other things on the joints, like you said, but it, it's difficult when someone's on your back to, to know what to do or yeah. to get it right every time too when you're under that pressure. Yeah, I mean, I like I like the front headlock position. Mm, um, me too, wrestling, right? Yeah, and I, yeah, and I feel like so many, you know, Everybody drills back defense, yeah. right? Especially yeah. with uh, with jujitsu overtime, uh, EBI overtime. Sure. Everybody's starting there. People are pretty good at defending from the back. Uh, you put somebody in a front headlock, and and you've got your darses, your Japanese neckties, your Peruvian neckties, your guillotines, and and your ability to transition from one submission to the next. You can you can put some people in some deep water. Yeah, absolutely. Especially you know, to, not to hammer home the point, but a wrestling background. I mean, the idea that you know these people are good at sprawling or that you're very, you have a strong sprawl, arguably stronger than anybody that's going to pick it up in jujitsu if you've been sure. doing it for multiple years. Um, you know, slamming that hip down and putting that pressure on the person, that front headlock position, it, it opens up a lot for you when that's uh, that's your strength. Yeah, I mean, if I'm on somebody's back, they're not necessarily holding my weight. Right, right. right? If, I'm, if I'm in a front headlock position, 
uh, your, the bottom guy's life bracket is, is draining. You yeah. know, I, I talk a, a lot about uh, fighting like it's a video game, right? Yeah. And any time that I'm in that front headlock position, your, your life is sort of oh, yeah. edging down slowly. If I'm on your back, maybe yeah. not so much. Yeah, like you said, a lot of people train there. They're kind of comfortable with someone on their back. They're figuring yeah. it out. The breathing's not tough necessarily. Right. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, anytime I can force my opponent to carry my weight, that's why you get on top. Because yeah. the person carrying the weight is doing more work. And over the duration of the fight, that's going to pay dividends. Yeah. And, and you mentioned that you guys uh, want to compete about once a month. Um, so what does preparation look like? Is it just where you mentioned your competition team, so we're always in competition shape? Or is it something like at the beginning of each month, we're beginning this four-week process to compete? No. Um, you know, before, right, it was, it was just jujitsu. Um, now we're going to have uh, strength and conditioning classes. We're we're bringing in the aerodynes and the versa climbers and uh, the battle ropes and the, the fun herbs. stuff. Yeah, to to really ensure that the you know the cardio is on point. Yeah. Um, but before it was just no, let's let's get in and compete all the time. And uh, you know, I there's there's a lot of ways to compete. You know, you, you can compete where you've done everything, everything in your power, and you win, and that shows you. You know, when I do everything, I can win. You can have times where you've done everything in your power and you lose. And that shows you that sometimes it doesn't go your way. Yeah. You can have times where you didn't train and you win. And that shows you that you're capable of more than you know. Mm-hmm. And and then you have times where you didn't train and you get your ass kicked and tell you you better train. Yeah. You yeah. know, and I, and I think all four of those competition experiences are valuable. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I truly believe that competition is the flame in which the warrior's will is tempered. And so I love that we go into that fire as often as, as possible. Um, you know, it, because it teaches you about yourself. It's yep. like when you put yourself into hard situations, that's where you learn. That's where you grow. I mean, we talk all the time. It's like, it doesn't, it's like showing up to train when you feel good. That's easy. Everybody does yep. that. Once you want to quit and you don't, that's where the progress is. Made. Absolutely. And that happens in tournaments far more than it happens in, in the gym. Yes. You know, it's like you're down on points and you're looking up and I'm there in the corner saying time to go. You know, you're going to you're going to find that extra gear. Yep. And once you find it there, it's going to continue in the rest of your life. I mean, yeah. it's, that's uh, that's the hope. I agree. Yeah. yeah, it forces that growth. And then it also gives you a different perspective. It gives you that perspective of being able to look back and see what actually worked in competition sure. versus what might work in practice, but doesn't translate quite as well. Yeah. And that can be a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, especially in MMA, like competing is, is a whole different, whole different ball game. You know, it's yeah. like, in my belief, like you should never really be throwing power and sparring, mm-hmm. you know, um, the way that, <laughs> that sparring was when I came up is a whole lot different than it is now before like we understood about CTE and yeah. things like that um, and I still see a lot of gyms that I think spar too hard um, once you've been hit you know if your guy's a fighter you know if he's going to curl up when he gets hit or if he's going to move forward and if you already know that he's going to move forward you don't need to hit him yep. hard to to continue to show you something that you already know yeah. you know I think I think 99% of sparring should be tech sparring Absolutely. Where, where we're just figuring out patterns, setting traps, and, and going from there. And I think for the benefit of the sport, we are seeing, like you said, a, a transition more towards that, more towards that, you know, for lack of a better phrase, a tie style where they're more playful with the sparring yeah. as opposed to trying shoot to hurt your partner. Shoot box style. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, shoot box style where everyone's getting knocked out or Dutch style. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. So, so take me back then. Let me uh, just to kind of give a, an overview. I mean, nine and five as a pro fighter. Um, running your own gym, 10th Planet, very successfully. Um, I've sat, outgrown three gyms, now working on building your own and, and creating a team, not only a jiu-jitsu team, but a mixed martial arts gym out of this gym, or a mixed martial arts team out of this gym, and uh, and building a, a community that's bigger than yourself, you know, a, a dream of a lot of martial artists, in my opinion. So so help me understand how you got here. So when uh, you mentioned you wrestled prior to finding 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu, was that your first experience kind of in that martial arts world? Mixed yeah. Martial arts? Yeah, I started wrestling when I was like four and a half. My dad was oh, a wow. coach. <laughs> so I was, you know, I sort of grew up on the side of the mat. Yeah. And uh, Your dad was a wrestling coach then? Yep. Got it. Yep. And, and, you know, knew that that was something I wanted to do um, as soon as I could. Yeah. And uh, I lost my first match without getting my thumb out of my mouth. Ooh. So, how old are you? Six? Uh, no, no, I was uh, four and a half. Five. Wow, with your first yeah, match, I, I was five. Wow, my okay, first match. Yeah, cool. Got stuck with my thumb in my mouth. <laughs> I don't remember it, but that's what I've been told. That's the story. Yeah. Um, 
and uh and yeah pretty much um you know i didn't i didn't really start fighting until until fifth grade i used to uh i lived up in the mountains we didn't have a tv i think that made me like a little socially awkward or whatever and uh i was getting picked on a lot and one night i was i was crying myself to sleep and uh and my mom basically said like you're allowed to stick up for yourself like you don't you don't have to take this anymore wow and uh and then the next day i beat up three kids at school what a powerful (laughs) moment wow (laughs) um and from then on i i just never walked away again you know i never i never let somebody put me down or or uh, or bully me anymore so i i basically started fighting them but i didn't I didn't know how to fight probably until a couple fights into my pro career. I and mean, after, after my first fight, uh, the Muay Thai coach at, at the gym came up to me and said, you know, congratulations, but if you're going to represent my gym, you better learn how to fight. Yeah. Like, I'll learn how to punch. You right, know, I'll right. see you on Monday at 7 a.m. Wow. I mean, I literally didn't understand that a punch wasn't generated from your arm. Like, I thought yeah. you swing your arm. You and I both. I had I had no <laughs> understanding of, of hip yeah. rotation or generating power that way. It was like I just knew if he was close enough to hit me, I was close enough to grab him. You're right. And I was gonna put him on the ground and, and beat him up and, you know, take his back, choke him out. What's funny though is a lot of wrestlers end up having a lot of power in the because when they figure out the striking aspect, when they figure out how to train their whole body because you're constantly working your hips right yeah. having your hips down and flipping them over quickly is very advantageous in a wrestling setting and sure. that's also what's bringing the explosion in the in the right hand or the left hook it's just figuring out how to make your body all work together in this new aspect that it's not so familiar with yeah yeah the left hook is is probably my strongest punch because it's the exact same as a head and arm yeah you're right. you know i would snap somebody and you know boom and when their head comes up throw the head and arm and the hook is the same, exactly the same. You know, the way that I generate power on that head and arm yep. is the same way you generate power on that hook. Wow, cool. So, so you uh, you wrestled um, from four and a half through high school. Did you wrestle in college too? Yeah, I wrestled at Ithaca College. Ithaca College, nice. I did, uh, did five years there. I was wow. Had twenty wins. My my freshman year, I, I redshirted, got a medical redshirt my true freshman year. I had twenty wins. Uh, the next year and then sort of academic pressure and, and different things. I uh, ended up wrestling my last match in college at 184 pounds. Wow. Um, we, uh, I was a national qualifier at 149, but we had, uh, you know, uh, the, our 47 or uh, 57 pounder will at his ACL. So I moved up to 57 and then he came back Our 65 pounder got a concussion. So I moved up to 65 and I kept just That's wrestling of, for you. Yeah, just, just jumping up and, and filling in different spots on the roster. I never, I never really felt like I was able to accomplish what I wanted uh, yeah. with wrestling. That's, so MMA came around and it was like, okay, here's another way to, to chase a championship. That's so interesting because it's actually, I, it didn't happen to me. I wasn't good enough in wrestling, but I wrestled in high school and there were guys on my team that faced that. Like, you know, they were number one in the state at their weight class, but because our wrestling team had so many holes in it, they would have to wrestle up in this match or wrestle down. This, and it, it does, it doesn't, you know, it's good for the team, but on an individual basis, it doesn't let you maybe chase your, uh, your potential quite as much. I guess maybe you get better because you're wrestling way up a weight class, but you're not able to chase the uh, the glory, the prestige quite sure. as much. Yeah. I mean, I'm, one thing I'm super excited about, because I miss the, the team aspect of it, is the whole quintet. You know, yeah, I, I think, that's cool. The, yeah, the ju- I, I think grappling the five jiu-jitsu. on five yeah. grappling matches, team matches like that, I think that's you know a, a future of, of the sport for I love sure. it. I love it. I was always thinking, uh, you know, I started in jiu-jitsu as well, wrestled then jiu-jitsu, kind of had the same uh, epiphany as you. I fought three times, I took the guy down, beat him up on the ground, and in my fourth fight, I just got outboxed on the feet to the point where... You know, I go in a back alley and I'm puking my brains out after the fight. So from concussion. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> but in that moment, you know, I realized I gotta learn how to hit people. I gotta learn how to do this. And that's what yeah. led me to kickboxing and Muay Thai. But it's a it's an interesting journey that you don't necessarily um understand the importance of striking until you're in that position where, you know, you get him beat up. <laughs> yeah. I mean I just I just wish that I had um the caliber of coaching that's available to my athletes right. now yeah you know i mean when i started nobody nobody was an mma coach no. because there was an mma yep. um you know i didn't have any amateur fights there weren't amateur fights back then yep. you know I, I remember i drove down to some gym and hit the heavy bag for a round and and grappled with some guy on the commission for a round and they gave me my pro card <laughs> um, so. my first fight was in uh in virginia i lived in north carolina and uh, i didn't know but 
you know, it's just a flight available in Virginia, take it. I show up there and it's uh, full rules, you know, it's might as well be pro because there was no amateur in Virginia at the time. Right. I, I lucked out that I didn't get a terrible matchup for myself. I still lost, but it could have been way worse. You know, it could have sure. been a tie dude in there throwing sure. knees and elbows and it yeah. messed up. So it's interesting looking back how the, it was, you know, a little bit more Wild West, even until like, what, five, eight years ago, it was yeah. pretty wild. I mean, now, luckily, you've got guys from my generation that, that are coaching. Right. So you got guys who know how to blend it together. Yep. But it was like when I came in, I was basically on my own tasked with figuring out how do I close the distance from striking to grappling? Because in wrestling, all your setups are based on on my hands being on you. Yep. I mean, most of them, right? You got you got guys like John Smith who wrestled for me outside. Yeah. Um, but that that wasn't my style. I was sort of a, a Brands Brothers Iowa style, yeah. you know, head to head. Yeah, clubbing. grind. <laughs> yeah, and, and grind on guys. But if I can't if I can't use a collar tie to set up my shots. It's like in wrestling, you're only as good as your setup, and I didn't have any setup, so I yeah. had to sort of figure that stuff out. Now you got a whole bunch of guys who are coaching who have figured it out and, and have sort of laid the blueprint down. Yeah. It's like I had Eddie Bravo, who was my jiu-jitsu coach, and thank God he was, you know, uh, had the foresight to understand that you know the gi doesn't translate to mixed martial arts, and that he was uh, he was focused on improving jiu-jitsu and mixed martial arts. So all of my jiu-jitsu translated, but I had to figure out how to close the distance. My striking coach had never shot a takedown. Yeah. You know, it's like I had a boxing coach. I had a Muay Thai coach. Right. I had a jiu jitsu coach. And it's coach, on you to blend and I was And I was the wrestling coach at the gym. <laughs> they said, oh, you know how to wrestle great. So now, now I'm teaching. So, um, you know, people who, who come into our gym now, it's like they've, yeah. they've, got, they've got something pretty special. That's very similar to what happened to me. I was uh, ended up being the jujitsu coach at the kickboxing gym because I came from the jujitsu world. And, right. You know, I'm not getting better at jujitsu in that case. Then I'm just getting better at kickboxing. And, you know, I would argue that's kind of what derailed my MMA career. I, you know, I did fall in love with striking, but I felt that I wasn't able to get good enough in the grappling and the striking at once at any single gym. And both the gyms happen to have this rule that they don't want you training with another gym, you know? And yeah. that was kind of that old school mentality too. Like uh, yeah, we if don't, you train here, it's only here. Yeah. We're not like that. Train wherever you want with whoever you want. Um, teach them our stuff so they can try and figure out how to beat it. Cause I don't want to, I don't want stuff that doesn't work. Against right. The best guys in the world. Hey. And if they've got something cool, bring it home and show it to us. Yep. Um, that's a good mentality to have. And, yeah. and you mentioned Heather Joe Clark, too. I mean, she you you spoke to the idea of the coaches that she worked with. I mean, those were people that were the forefathers of blending it, right? The Robert Robert Fullis's of the world. Uh, I mean, how many guys under him? You know, Kevin Lee is one of the newer guys, but there were many before him that um, that showed you we can grapple at a high level. We can wrestle. We can jujitsu. Yeah. And we're going to have some power in our hands and, and kicks, too. You know, we're going to have the striking aspect down. Mike Winkle, John, you know, Jackson yeah. Wink. I mean, those guys were, were definitely, uh, you know, grandfathers of, of that blending it all together and, and bringing that next level of mixed martial artist uh, yeah. to the sport. And now you've just seen it consistently evolve where guys, I mean, it, it's tremendous seeing some of these younger guys and how much better they get from one fight to the next. Um, mm -hmm. An easy one that's coming up, I mean, Corey Sandhagen, you know, over at uh, Elevation, but also... Yeah. Sean O'Malley, I mean, both those guys are just showing up each fight and getting tremendously better and making guys that are very good and at the highest level of the sport, but perhaps a, a slight generation before them look like they don't know what they're doing in there. Yeah, it's I mean, it's just, wild. Just look at Ryan Hall versus BJ Penn. Yes. Wow. I mean, that one is a tremendous difference right? in ability. Well, because BJ Penn used to be the jujitsu guy in yeah. MMA. Yeah. And then, like, to turn the wrong way, trying to fight that. Oh, hip I hunt. know, I know. I thought it was gonna, I thought it was gonna yeah, explode yeah. out. <laughs> I thought he was gonna get Vinny Magalish. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, that was ugly too with um, Craig. Uh, yeah, Craig Jones. Craig Jones. Oh my goodness, he just won again this past weekend over Wagner Rocha, yeah. right? Or, yeah, in OT. Yeah, that's big. Yeah, Wagner did a great job of avoiding the uh, the leg entanglements for the most part during the whole. Right. Um, but he he was engaging, which is nice to yes. see. Like uh, instead of when, just avoiding. Yeah, when you saw Boogie and uh, yeah. and uh, Mr. Van Zant. Uh, yeah, I forget. The guy. Austin. Yeah, Austin. Yeah. It's like he he felt the power of the rubber guard with that carny attempt, like a minute in. And then was Wasn't like, okay, I'm, yeah. I'm done with this. You yeah, know, I would argue. Then he kind of did that a little bit too. You know he. I guess he gave Wagner, up the leg at one point. Uh, or Vinny. I've, I felt like Vinny could have engaged more with Craig Jones. You know, he 
it was, he was mainly just defending that leg. Yeah. Well, I was just I was just so surprised. It's like before I had a, a more robust knowledge of the leg entanglement game. It was just don't let anybody's leg inside yours. Yeah. And disengage as soon as there's as they try and and you know set up that entanglement. Yeah. But but be attack you know be be diving on the right, head right. diving on you right. know, Kimura's dive you know pressing the pace and uh, it just amazed me his his seeming like yeah you know, I mean he you know he said leg locks don't work right that's so his I, meme thing you right know? <laughs> and then coming in and and really not respecting it like not even not clear it's like dude if I was if I was grappling Craig Jones believe me I would not have him touch no him way leg, no know? way because like, you know how dangerous he is he, he yeah. wrecks everybody and to go in there and, and play that game with them that's I mean it was suicide and it, you know we saw what happened. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I hope he's okay. Like, I mean, he a spiral could be tibial, long, you know? spiral tibial fracture. Woo. I mean, I haven't seen anything from him on social media. I haven't talked to him recently. You know, who knows what that's going to be like? That leg was as ugly as I've seen. Yeah, yeah, it was rough to watch. But you know, that's uh, that's his his shtick, right? Yeah. Leg locks don't work. I mean, there's so many guys I think in MMA that they're too tough for their own good. Oh yeah, I think mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, like everybody's like, oh, look at his face. Like he didn't even care. You're, when you're fighting, man, you know you fought. It's like it's almost an out of body experience. Okay. You know, you're absolutely nothing hurts. You can't feel anything when you're in there. It's like yep. you're, you know, superhuman. And then, then the crowd's the gone, fight. and <laughs> and then you, know, you look down and realize your leg's backwards. Oh yeah, it's my uh, I had be. some leg damage after my last fight. I was a little worried to get on the plane, but it ended up being all right. With blood clots. Yeah, I mean, it just uh, got my front leg worked over by a dude. I was very good with leg kicks, and it yeah. was you know three times the size the next day when I was getting on the plane. It was a little frightening. Yeah, yeah, I've been there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my first my first day of MMA sparring, I went home with a like a three times the size lead leg. Didn't know how to check kicks. Hey, yeah, you mentioned uh, Benny the Jet. Um, he was actually there was a picture of him up in the first gym where I went to kickboxing. That you know I went. It was American kickboxing, so all above the waist. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean that was a huge learning lesson for me. I came here, sparred with Sean Madden, and it was preparing for a fight. I think a week after the fight, just worked my leg over. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean it was eye opening. It was okay. This style is effective in certain aspects, but you have to be able to check kicks if you're fighting yeah. the tie guy. You know that's that's the difference maker. Well, and now right, the evolution of the sport is is nobody's even kicking above the knee. Yeah, you yeah. Know, now the calf it's, kicks. now it's all calf kicks. You saw. Um, I mean, Factory X had a beautiful, beautiful yeah. Turnout Chris Gutierrez is. is yeah. I mean, his his striking is technical. Like, I, don't, yep. I think people are underrate how good his kickboxing is. Yeah, it was beautiful. I mean, yeah. that, you know that that fight was you know, flawless victory. Yeah, yeah. And Brandon Royville faced a little bit of adversity early, but I mean, first of all, no one comes out like that round one is able to sustain that through three rounds yeah. like Tim Elliott yeah, did. Yeah, I wonder what, I mean, I wonder what Tim was thinking. Just smash that. him, I guess, smash him fast. But especially for being built like that, he's not, it's clearly not a finesse build. Like, yeah. you know, if you go out that hard in round one, you better finish him. Well, you saw that kid spike um, Carlisle, yes, yeah, same issue, same issue. Man, that was a hell of a fight. Uh, to yeah. me, that was the fight of the night. That 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 fight blew me away. That he was as explosive as he was through that whole thing. I think he probably should have won. I mean, I maybe we're giving the other guy the knockdown in that first round but for when he turns away. I mean, that would be the difference maker. Oh, uh, right when he walked yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, got so knocked you, down. So, you, you so if you give him that, round. you know, theoretically ten eight to nine, then I could see him winning. But I thought yeah, Spike did enough. The first two. Yeah. I I thought yeah. he did enough. Interesting. Well, the thing that's messed up with with modern MMA scoring, right, is it's if you narrowly edge the first round, narrowly edge the second round, and get and get your ass kicked in the, in the last round, that that's a draw. Right. Yeah. And it's like lately, though, it's been weird. Lately, they seem to be given to the person winning at the end, which which I think is great. Yeah, if we're looking at it from a big grand perspective, that's probably the way to judge who's yep. winning at the yep. end of the fight. But that's not that, the way they're saying they're that's, judging. Yeah, that's not the way it's supposed to be done. Right. right? I mean. Hundred percent. I mean, to me, the way I started, this guy on top, and the cops get there. <laughs> exactly, like, exactly. That, that dude won. That dude won. He and whooped he was his on ass. Top, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, just the idea that you can narrowly edge and get a ten nine round in the first, ten nine in the second, and then lose ten eight in the third, and that's a draw. Yeah, it's like, crazy. It's like no, dude, you, you were hanging in there, and then you got your ass kicked. Yep. Yep. So, anyways, yeah. So. Um, so, so you mentioned kind of your career, how you felt the need to progress uh, the striking, um, but mainly it was just to get close and then and then implement your game, your your grappling heavy game. Um, so, 
initially when you started fighting, it was just this idea that you've been scrapping your whole life essentially up to that point, and it just made sense when when this guy introduced you to Eddie Bravo and he started doing jujitsu more. It's yeah, just... I mean, I was uh, you know, I was in the gym training with those guys, uh, Amir Renovardi, uh, Jason Chambers. Oh yeah. Um, Jason, Carl yeah, Parisian. He could stand up, Jason Chambers. Yeah, he's the guy who chewed my leg up my first day of sparring. <laughs> Carl Parisian, another OG. Um, cool. Yeah, so you know those guys were in there, and and they uh, they basically asked me if I ever thought about fighting. And, uh, and the idea kind of terrified me. I remember, you know, sitting in Spanish class, uh, having to fight some kid after school and, and being so scared, yeah. which, I mean, in hindsight, it was so ridiculous. Like, I mean, I was training every day of my life almost since the time I was four and a half. Right. I was in wrestling shape. And this is like some punk kid, like about my size, smoking cigarettes, hanging out with his buddies, drinking beer on the weekends. And I was worried about losing. Or maybe you're respectful that anybody can come in there and knock you out at any time, you sure. know, like it's a, maybe that's a legitimate fear. Yeah. Um, but, I, but just, just remembering how scared I was and I only had to wait a couple class periods. And then, so I was thinking like, <laughs> Okay, like you wanna you wanna get tough. Let's let's wait three months for a guy who's training right. for you to beat you up. Right. So I'm a, a firm believer that that fear is a pretty good barometer of uh, growth experiences. Okay. If if something's the scarier something is, the more likely it is to evolve your soul. And so I said, no, I'm terrified. Okay, sign me up. Sure. And you know, signed up for the first fight. I won my first fight. Um, asked for a leave of absence from work to train for the second one. They said no, so I quit my job. Wow. And Dove uh, in. Yeah, and started going hard. Wow. So was this, uh, you mentioned you, you got your pro card by showing up, doing a little grappling. So these are pro fights. Yep. Right away. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, I fought for uh, an organization called Pangea. Um, my first fight was at the, f no, it wasn't the Forum. It was at the Palladium. Cool. On, uh, you know, in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I had that first fight. One asked for leave of absence. They said no. I, uh, you know, pretty shortly thereafter quit the job to train for the second one. Um, I can't remember if I, I don't know, won or lost that one. I think I lost my, it may have been my second fight that I lost. I don't know, but. Brett Cooper? Yeah. Was yeah, that my second he's fight? He's a bad dude, too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that fight, man, that was rough because he, uh, I trained. I can't remember if I trained for Orthodox and he came out Southpaw or vice versa. Oh. But but like one, I had very limited kickboxing knowledge. And since my first fight to the second fight, all I did was focus on me. I mean, I was still going to jiu-jitsu every day, but right. I was like really intent on getting better at striking. Yeah. So I'm standing with the guy and whatever his record was at the time, we talked to him afterwards and he had something like seven or eight more fights in Mexico that didn't show up on it. And the footage that I saw of him, he was one stance. And then he came out fighting the second stance. And Damn. I was circling into his power. Uh, and I, got, I got dropped twice in the first round. Um, and I remember sitting in, in the corner before the third round. Mac Danzig was working my corner. Oh, wow. And, uh, Robert and, Poles. And he said, uh, you got to... It's like you got to win the, you got to win this round, or you got to finish him. You lost the first two rounds, and I was like, first two. It's like, oh, we're in the third round. Like I didn't even remember the round, yep, you know. Yep. Um, and then I was just, I remember I was so excited for that fight, like pumped up backstage, and and then afterwards I came back. I got like my, one of my tooth messed up. I got my nose broken, and uh, and. The uh, the commissioner's like, oh, you still think this is something you want to do? And I was like, hell yeah, I, really? I love this. Cool. You know, it's, I had uh, had a lot of fire, yeah. you know, and and I I was very grateful to have a place where I could express it yeah. without going to jail. Right. And then you won your next four your next four fights as a pro. Um, I mean, the the names you have on here too: L. C. Davis, George Grugel, K. J. Noons, Ryan Couture. I mean, those are those are big names, big top yeah. top guys in the top organizations. So, you know, for someone not having any type of amateur career, that that's quite the deep end to dive into. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I don't think too many people had had <laughs> amateur careers at that time. Sure, you know, um, and I mean, I'd probably, I don't know. I mean, now I figure I've had well over fifteen hundred matches. Um, you know, I was I was doing thirty matches uh, a season in high school, and then I was probably <laughs> yeah. I was like as a cadet, uh, I was doing cadets and juniors freestyle and Greco. So if I lost every match on a Saturday, I was guaranteed eight matches. Wow! So I'd sometimes get twenty matches on on a Saturday. Yeah. Um, in the summer, 
solo. Oh, because summer they do both. Yeah, so you get freestyle really? and Greco, and then cadet is like sixteen and under, and junior is eighteen and under. Yeah. So as a cadet, I would enter both age groups, both styles. Nice. So I would potentially have you know five matches each style, each tournament. Whatever. So so maybe no explicit amateur fighting experience, but I mean that those are invaluable experiences too. I remember what it was like lining up against you know putting my foot on the line against someone that. I knew was better than me in yeah. wrestling and having to just deal with it. So I mean, it's a it's an experience, uh, nonetheless. Yeah, even I mean, though you it's might a be combat a sport, fun. right? I mean, it's like wrestling yeah. is a combat sport. Absolutely, is a combat sport. You're still dealing with the nerves. You're yep. still adrenaline. Dealing with the weight cut. You're yep. st- you know, it's like okay, we added some some extra you know extra yep. techniques that I could use. But that's what I what I liked about wrestling is. Well, I mean, what I liked about fighting, I guess, it's like I never lost a wrestling match where I didn't walk off the match and think, man, I whipped that guy's ass. Right. This was a fist fight. Oh, right. yeah, exactly. If, if, if I could have punched him, it would have been right. over. <laughs> um, I mean, that's that's the interesting uh, dichotomy between jujitsu and wrestling to me yeah. is that in wrestling, your ego is preserved 100% yes. Because, yes. because the ref is there to tell you that you lost. Yeah. The ref is there to tell you that's potentially dangerous. Guy goes on my on my ankle. I can turn into him, putting my knee in danger because I know the ref's going to stop it and yep. save me. Yep. And then in jujitsu, you're responsible for saving yourself, and and your ego dies a little bit. Oh, it's tough. You know? And so there's a there's an interesting balance between those two that I that I think is, you know, is is interesting to say. The Absolutely, least. it's definitely an evolution going from wrestling to jujitsu, and even the understanding of don't squeeze so much. You know, you're sure. not just going to use brute strength to get out of every position. Like you might be able to against this guy, but probably not that guy. That's you know that much more technically sound. Yeah. So, uh, so nine and five as a pro, um, what, what kind of brought the end to the fighting career? What, what made you decide it was time to, to hang up the gloves? Uh, multiple hip surgeries. That'll do it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, I felt that I'd never lost a fight until the Ryan Couture fight. Yeah, and that was your um, last fight, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd never been finished. Mm-hmm. Um, everything was a split decision except for Gurgel. Uh, and I mean, Couture's another jiu-jitsu guy, right? I mean, like, I know his dad's right. Uh, he Ryan went my ass striking. Really, um, really? His, his foot, I mean, he's working with Robert Follis. He's yeah. Work, he's working with, the you know, Randy Couture. He's yeah. got the best coaches in the game. Yeah. And while I think Eddie is, is the best jiu-jitsu coach, um, He's not an MMA coach. And she'll tell you that. Yeah. Chris Riley, you know, never fought MMA. Yeah. Frankie Lyle, my boxing coach, you know, never wrestled. Right. So, um, I mean, I left after I lost to to KJ Nunes. I left. Uh, Which was a bang, Legends. banger of a fight. Yeah, it was a fun one. <laughs> um, after I lost that fight, I went to Jackson's. Cool. Um, but I wasn't getting coaching at jackson's yeah. you know I was, I was getting great sparring I, yeah. I used to i used to puke walking across the uh the parking lot every tuesday and thursday before there. <laughs> before big glove sparring you know it's like i'd have you know you'd have five rounds every round with a fresh guy and i'd have Oof. clay guida uh, joe stevenson cowboy diego Brandon guys that aren't now. getting tired well I mean, it's <laughs> just all killers yeah. you know and back then everybody was trying to kill everybody yeah you know yeah. I mean, Cub Swanson got his face shattered by, uh, who was it, uh, Melvin Gallard? You know, like the oh, week. God, like, Gallard was with them back then too. Yeah, I mean, I mean, guys were getting knocked, get, get beat up. Bad. I, feel, I, I might puke before uh, having to spar Melvin Gallard. That'd yeah. be a little frightening. <laughs> Michael Johnson, another southpaw. Yeah. Like, you know, it, it, that 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 room prepared me because I knew anybody yeah. I was fighting. It's like I get the same guy for three rounds. So I'm going to be able to figure them out. Right. One, it's like when you're when you're sparring a new guy every five minutes, yep. you can't like you've got to be really really quick at picking up their patterns and being able to adjust to them. Yep. That makes it challenging. And so yep. it's like, man, if I'm I'm only fighting three rounds and it's the same guy, and the amount of work that I put in is going to wear him down and make him tired, I can do this. So so yep. I wasn't I wasn't ever I mean I was never really scared once it became fight time anyway because yep. I put in the work. But after training at Jackson's, it was like, whoever you are, I don't care. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, that's the, the benefit of training with lions, right? Everybody else looks a little tamer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Those, those are crazy days. But so, I mean, it came, got to a point just where you didn't want to physically do it anymore. I mean, it was well, just too much. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't run going at all, going yeah. into that fight with Couture. Um, but, uh, you know, the way that the health insurance works, I didn't have health insurance that covered me yep. outside of a fight. Right. So I had to fight. 
to get fixed. Um, yep. Yeah, to get fixed. And, and then there was a whole bunch of, uh, you know, back and forth with the UFC on whether they were going to cover that stuff because, like, in their in their defense, yeah, it was a degenerative injury. Huh. You know, hips. I mean, I tore my labrums, sure. right? But but it was like, man, I've been in combat sports at that point for something like thirty years. Yeah, you know, and uh, wrestling's not easy on the hips either. No, so yeah, so after after that, I was still, you know, thinking about making a comeback, but uh, had the first series of hip surgery. Things went real rough. Um, surgery took like six hours more than it was supposed to. They broke two saws trying to cut through my pelvis. They said they'd never seen bone density like mine before. Um, I lost half my blood. I was in the hospital for eight days following wow. the surgery. Felt like as close to death as I'd ever been. I would imagine. Didn't, that surgery basically didn't work. So then two years later, I went and had bilateral hip resurfacing. So I got cobalt chromium metal hips now. So it was like after five hip surgeries, I was like, ah, you know, I get that. I'll, I'll just, I probably, I'll just probably walk away. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm just excited that I can still compete in jujitsu. Yeah, it is cool. You know, um, I, uh, I had one of those uh, where you don't train and you get your ass kicked moments at sure. my, my most recent tournament, you know, focusing on, on coaching rather than training myself. Sure. But uh, I mean, it's it's been a journey and, and I, would, yeah. I wouldn't really change change too much of it. I, I wouldn't have got my first hip surgery. I would have gone immediately to the replacement. But, sure. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, an amazing journey. And I think one that uh, can be looked at by other fighters or current martial artists as, as a possible route, you know, a possible route to take fighting and then opening a gym afterward and, and creating a community. You know, I think that uh, the one challenge of when you leave fighting potentially is also leaving that community so the idea that you can then sure. start a gym and build a new community and impact new people's lives even people that perhaps weren't in martial arts before they stumbled upon your gym that's a powerful thing you know it's a it's a cool thing to be able to do with your life yeah i mean just the just the ability to to positively impact yeah. people's life is great i mean we've got a, a kid on my team who uh, had angoraphobia he was like afraid of open spaces he yeah. had he, i think he told me he left his house like twice in the in the year before he started with us wow. um and you know made a bunch of friends uh yeah just put on like 25 pounds of muscle wow. he, he looks great yeah you know, yeah he's gained confidence he's gained community and, and that's the type of stuff it's like that's what what fires me up now yeah no i love it i love it and it's cool seeing your passion too i mean i think that's something that, that's not fakeable right you know you're 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 um carrying your empathy for these people for building the community and for the sport in general obviously you have a lot of love for wrestling a lot of love for jiu-jitsu a lot of love for mixed martial arts and now you get to pass it on so it's it's cool to see from a outsider's perspective as yeah. well yeah the the love for mixed martial arts certainly isn't as great as the love for jiu-jitsu and yeah. wrestling um me heather and i you know just because of the the damage it can do to people I know it is tough. It is tough. I, and I hear people kind of mimic this, but I'm not by any means old, 29. But as I get older, it is a little bit weirder, you know, that yeah. the other person on the other end of that has to deal with, whether it's the loss on the upside, but the downside, you know, physical damage. It is a, yeah. it's a tough I mean, thing just, to come You to just see with. all these fights recently, right, where people are talking about should it have been stopped early? Was that yeah. a late stoppage? All of that stuff. It's like, you know, watching watching the Anthony Smith fight, yep. watching the Ferguson fight. Um, you know, I told Heather. Ferguson, that was tough. That was wrong. Too tough. tough for his own good. No yeah. quitting him. I would, it's like, like Smith to me looked like he didn't want to be in there anymore. Yeah. Right? And, you know, I'm, I'm not his coach. No judgment on that. Coach, yeah. and, coach and fighter have their own. Yeah, own it's, a, it's up to them. Yeah, that's know. their dynamic. I mean. I was backstage and the ref would say, is there anything you want to tell me? I'd say, yeah, I'm double jointed. Don't stop anything. Yeah. You know, I, I, I agree. Like it looked like he wasn't like, I'm going to look for a way out. Right. He could have given up the neck. Sure. He could have gotten choked. Yep. He could have even taken the ground and pound, but he right. decided to keep fighting. Yeah. So, I mean, to, to his credit, clearly that was a mentality that he had. Yeah. So for his coach to say, I'm not going to step in and stop it. He, he seems Lionheart for a reason. Yeah, you can find a way out of there, right? Like, yeah. there's a you, if you want to get choked, you'll get choked. Sure. There, there's people that you see, like, oh, okay, it looks like they just quit right there. Yeah. And he wasn't quitting, so you know, should the rest step in? Maybe, maybe not. Who cares? But the Tony Ferguson, like, him on his feet, he's not going to stop fighting. That one, I was glad they stopped it there. That was yeah. that was time. When he got, 
Do you think it was that last punch that broke his orbital when he started shaking his I want to say so. I mean, yeah. that rat, that rattled me just watching. I was like, yeah. oh, oh. And you know the feeling where your head kind of comes forward and it just meets it. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that was rough for me to watch. Well, I was, I was telling Heather, is like, we're letting our fighters know <laughs> you don't get the miracle moment. No. If you're getting your ass kicked. I like that. I'm throwing in the towel. You know, and maybe that's me me in the speaking from the wrong position. I'm not a yeah. coach and you know, I, I am a fighter, but I, if it was my fighter in there, I'd want to throw the towel pretty quickly. I'd be yeah. I'd be you know, I, that's someone like, that he, I have to talk to afterward. I have to deal with them in the back room, you know. Yeah. I wanna make look sure that they're family know. in the face. Exactly. You <laughs> know, it's like Yeah. I mean there are times where right, we can come back. You can sure. have these amazing comebacks. It happens, right? Sure. But our, our guys are going to know you're not going to get that opportunity with me in the corner. Yeah. If you're, and getting, th- if you're getting beat up. And that's, so that's a good feeling. Gym. That's a good feeling knowing uh, as a fighter that your corner's got your back. And it's something that's necessary in, in a world yeah. in uh, such as combat sports where you do have so much on the line. So I think that's a, that's a good thing. And, so, yeah. and I guess that fighters knowing that even if it's not explicitly said, knowing that in the back of their mind just means that they can pour themselves out there that much more. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm because yeah, I'm not letting guys take beatings like that. Hello. So, uh, so at this point in your career, you know, you're uh, like I said, kind of wrapped up the fighting side of things. Now you're on the coaching side of things, running a gym, running your own business, and coaching. It's an exciting time. Um, you know, obviously, as we come out of this coronavirus situation, stuff's going to ramp up even more for you. Um, so, what are your goals at this point in your career? Coach world champions. Cool. I love yeah, it. Nice I mean, whether whether that's uh, you know, jujitsu world champions. Or, or MMA world champions, you know, I just want to help people climb the mountain. Yeah, yeah, and you're doing it, so that's cool. Um, cool, man, so uh, you know, you've given us a great kind of idea of your journey here, you've detailed it quite a bit, given us the emotional side and your perspective, which has been awesome. Um, so if you had to kind of give a tip to maybe like the old you, young you, or even just another martial artist that's aspiring, coming up through the ranks right now, what would your tip be to them to kind of maximize their their career or just their journey in general? I would say bring a notebook and, and write down after after you practice, one, write down all the techniques that you learned. Um, when I was when I was wrestling, when I was competing, I would have micro goals for each practice, you know, where uh, I'm only going to hit triangles uh, today. Cool. You know, so that's it. And until I've hit 15 triangles, I'm not going to anything else. Me. I would I would do. And, and this is jujitsu guys would hate me for this right but i would have a squeeze day where i'm going to squeeze everything regardless <laughs> of you know i'm going to get an overhook and try and break the guy's arm with my overhook i'm going to i'm going to squeeze everything to build that isometric mm-hmm. uh, squeeze but to have you know one to have micro goals for every practice what you're focused on write it down before practice today i'm working on uh you know my my penetration step or today i'm working on this leg lock entry or, or whatever it is so that you have a finite goal for every training session um two i would write down everything that you learn because looking back um as a gym owner i wish that i'd written down all yeah. the techniques that that i learned over the years it would make uh putting together a curriculum a whole lot easier right. um, than when you're trying to pull it from your concussed brain <laughs> um yeah, I mean, a I notebook, like yeah, notebook for for micro goals, and then and then afterwards, um, you know, what you learned in the practice, what you did well, and uh, and what you could do better. You know, that's, two things you did well and one thing you could do better. That's great. That's great advice. Um, so, how can people follow you, the team, uh, online, and keep up with you guys? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm on Instagram at Coach Heun, H uh, E U N, um, at Ten Planet Denver, uh, Ten Planet Denver on Facebook. Yeah. So check them out online. Um, keep up with the new gym opening and, and go uh, sign up. And uh, while you're at it, subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Price Fighting Business. Follow us on Instagram. And don't forget to like us on Facebook. Thanks, yeah. Connor. Yeah, that was thank awesome, you, man. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Good.